Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We finished our new Hollywood period. New Hollywood cinema was skeptical, right? It's skeptical of American policies. It told us that, look, there is something very wrong with the American society, its politics. Uh, and therefore, th we need new themes, new wave, uh, ways of telling stories, new kinds of heroes. But what did cinema of the 80s do to us? It took us back to the pre-new wave cinema, where we were told that, look, America is still the superpower and the war in Vietnam can still be won. And therefore, we have all those Rambo movies and movies like Commando, where the enemy is always the other. Folk, uh, notice the race, okay, enemy is not within. In new Hollywood cinema, enemy is within. Did you note that? In new Hollywood cinema, they are not fighting uh, a war against others. Even when they are interrogating the Vietnam War, it is given, uh, uh, the perspective is also given from the other point of view. Okay, it is not just an out and out aggressive American point of view that we are looking at. But when you look at cinema uh, uh, of uh, Celeste Stallone or Schwarzenegger or even a film like Robocop, what are they doing? That America is taking over the world. That is a very strong message that comes across. And from after that, we gradually, so 80s over and then we gradually move towards the 90s. So, that is the cinema we are interested in, the postmodern cinema. And then we will also talk about various kinds of cinema, not just Hollywood. Hmm? So, please feel free to give your um, interpretations or opinions as I go on. So, uh, just re revising something that we must have already done. Postmodernism, root term is of course modernism. Postmodernism, postmodernism, literally something which comes after modernism. I think when we were doing cinema and modernism, we did talk about all these aspects. So, I would again suggest that you go back to cinema and modernism and then I will also give you a list of readings on modernism, because we cannot be talking in detail today about modernism. Hmm? Uh, by the mid late or uh, mid 60s and late 60s, it was felt that modernism as a movement was tame and conventional. What shock then became very traditional by the late 60s, even in cinema, in art, in literature, okay, so in all aspects of art and artistic uh, manifestations. So, modernism no longer had responses to all the questions. To read more about modernism, I will just give you a list of books. Okay? And this led to the growth of postmodernism. Now, uh, this is one book that I strongly recommend, Malcolm Bradbury's and James McFarlane, Modernism. It is a 1976 book. I think Ranjit, it could be of use to you. It has all aspects of culture. Raymond Williams, if you are interested in culture studies. And then you have this book called Five Faces of Modernity, Modernism, Avant-Garde, Decadence, Kitsch and Postmodernism. This is by Mati Kalinisko. There is a Cambridge Companion to Modernism by Michael Levinson and Dennis Walder's Literature in the Modern World is an out and out literary book. But Five Faces of Modernity is important in order to understand uh, even popular culture and uh, other aspects of art. Uh, apart from literature. Linda Hutchin in Politics of Postmodernism, uh, this is how she defines, postmodernism manifests itself in many fields of cultural endeavors and then she gives us a list, architecture, literature, 
photography, film, painting, video, dance, music and elsewhere. So, forces of postmodernism can be felt on various walks of life. She goes on, in general terms it takes the form of self-conscious, self-contradictory and self-undermining statement. Please note down these three terms, self-conscious, postmodern, postmodern art is highly self-conscious, self-referential, aware of itself. Some of the movies that I am going to discuss today are extremely self-conscious, self-contradictory. So, postmodernism accepts that the world around us is contradictory and fragmented. Those are the key features. In fact, if you want to look at postmodernism and spaces, postmodernism is more centered on uh, fragmented spaces than fragmented time. You know, spatial fragmentation is more important. Perhaps it could be of use to you. David Harvey's book is important, you know, fragmented specialities. So, if the literature of realism, you know re realism, we are talking about Victorian kind of literature, modernism was a revolt against uh, realism prevailing during the 19th century. So, if the literature of realism is a mode of narrative which is natural and presents a slice of life, the so called verisimilitude, hmm, closeness to life, postmodernism or postmodernist literature is a case against realism. And two terms again, those are Bakhtinian terms that you should know, dialogic and heteroglossic. Are you aware of that Tara? Dialogic and heteroglossic as opposed to monologic. Can anyone explain that to me? Sandeep? Bakhtin gives us these terms carnivalesque, dialogic, heteroglossic as opposed to monologic. When you have two things which have, which enter into dialogue as opposed to just one view, mm -hmm. so both the relationship that both have with respect to each other and how they affect each other. Is mm -hmm. So, if it is A and B, A has an effect on B and B also has an effect on A. Okay. So, mono, single, okay, single perspective, single tongue, single word as opposed to dialogic. So, it is not, it is literally having a dialogue. No? It, there has to be two or more than one person to have a dialogue. Hetero, many tongues, many words, multiple perspectives in other words. So, there is a necessity for having uh, a dialogic, heteroglossic perspective as opposed to monologic discourse. Hmm? And carnival, what is a carnival according to you? So many things come together, you know, it is like a pot puree of many things. So, again, this is a term uh, Bakhtin gives us. You can look these th terms up. So, why is postmodernist literature a carnivalesque literature? Because it brings together many tongues, many perspectives, many cultures. And by culture, we mean high bro as well as the so called low bro. Now, um, historically, the setting point for postmodernism is 1968, at least in literature, although uh, it must have made its presence felt even earlier. But then, um, more forcefully, we realize we have uh, looked, we uh, recognize the exact period as 1968 um, when Stephen Spender called it the year of the young rebels. So, postmodernism is often considered the nemesis of modernism, signifying a break from the earlier movement and a deliberate fracturing. Now, you look at cinema of the mid 60s, late 60s, 68, you know all these things, you know the major films made in that period, don't you? 
you also know cinema uh, made during the so called modernist period. Okay. Can you take a moment and think about those films which were made during the so called modernist period and then look at uh, cinema of the 60s, late 60s. What were they making in 68, the year of the young rebels? Easy Rider. The uh, breakthrough movie, Bonnie and Clyde. Hmm? And then subsequently, all those films that we have been talking about. Remember the list? Can you just help me recall, Sandeep? The list? Hmm? Uh, Chinatown, uh, Apocalypse Now. Mm. Uh, so, 68 to 78, we had that kind of movement, the graduate, dog day afternoon. Mm. Think of all these movies, Roman Polanski's films, Rosemary's Baby, The Exorcist, French Connection, we are looking at William Fritkin, we were looking at Coppola's Conversation. Mm. All these movies, they together constitute uh, the period of the young rebels. So, there is a thematic connection between the postmodernist literature as an artistic movement and also how you can connect it thematically, artistically, technically to cinema as well. Think about all these things, there is a pattern that emerges. Frederick Jameson, another very influential cultural critic, theoretician in his book, The Cult Postmodernism or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism, which was written in 1991, defines postmodernism as an erosion of the distinction between high and low culture. This is important, all of you should know that. Erosion between high and low culture and I am going to give you several examples from movies that we are going to do today erosion of boundaries between high and low, okay. incorporation of material from other texts. I okay. will give you some time to think about that and you will come, I am sure you will have your own interpretation of this. Postmodernism from according to Frederick Jameson signifies breaking down of boundaries between different genres of text or writing. Text could be cinematic text also. Postmodernist artists cannot invent new perspectives and new modes of expression. Instead, they operate as bricoliers. This is a nice word. What does it mean? Putting together several things. So, there is something you know, if modernism is a building, and then postmodernism comes and takes that building apart and whatever is left of the, the ruins of the, the rubbles of that building, they are used to create something else altogether that is brick, bricolage okay? and the person who does it is a bricolier. It is a French term, look it up, okay? it is very interesting to understand. So, a postmodern uh, post artist, in other words, is a bricolier who puts together fragments of na different narratives. Can you, uh, if you look at all these examples and quoting from different texts, uh, would you call Tarantino a bricolier? Cinema of Tarantino, a, a kind of bricolage. How many of you remember the opening scene? of Reservoir Dogs. Tell me what is it about? What are they talking about? High culture, low culture? Yeah, they talk about, uh, about American culture and uh, how uh, uh, like you know tipping and uh, their restaurant system works mm -hmm. and uh, how people earn money through tips and… Tipping the waitress, that is one thing. Another, Sandeep, do you remember something else that they talk about? They talk about pop culture, about that song of Madonna. Which song is that? Madonna's like a virgin and then they deconstruct the entire song. Okay. So, uh, discussing, totally deconstructing a Madonna song, uh, for no reason, it is just a couple of guys 
sitting together talking and the camera pans around them. So, what is Tarantino doing there? Referen referencing the pop culture, cult uh, certain key cultural aspects of American society and bringing everything together. There is one point when there is a Mexican standoff, remember that is Tarantino's favorite device. In every movie of his, he uses the Mexican standoff scene, a shot is always there. Especially, uh, I think he, uh, he follows or perhaps it is the other way around, John Woo follows him. So, in every John Woo movie, there is a Mexican standoff scene, that is a standard shot in Tarantino as well. Hmm. So, uh, Michael Madsen's character, if I remember it correctly, he calls Harvey Keitel. Uh, that is a Lee Marvin character. I do not know if you remember that, but I watched the movie quite recently and Michael Madsen calls Harvey Keitel, oh, this is a Lee Marvin again, uh, among us guys. Okay. And you remember what is Lee Marvin known for? Lee Marvin is known for playing those tough, macho kind, hyper masculine kind of guy. So, that is a, so references to popular culture. Hmm? We will look at other movie also, some other films also, where there is a mix of both high as well as pop culture. Frederick Jameson further says that postmodernists recycle previous works and styles. Recycling of previous works and styles. There will be blood. It is a recycling of what? What genre? typical western, but is this western hero the John, John Wayne kind of hero? No, there is a reinterpretation of the western myth, no? So, that is so the recycling genres, recycling previous styles, no country for old men, again reworking of a western genre. Have you watched the movie, no country for old men? Please do watch it as your essential viewing. more like a pastish, it works more like a pastish, but uh, mm, no country for old men and there will be blood, a mo more a serious political look at that uh, genre of western. After all, what is western all about? Western is a tip, a western hero is a typical strong individualistic American hero and how he triumphs over the so called other in all his films. You watch a movie like Shane, George Stevens Shane, Searchers, John Ford's Searchers. Now, what happens? The hero is always victorious, a lone ranger, but emerges victorious in the end, rides away into the sunset. He is essentially a lone ranger, but how do these two men end up? Daniel Plainview in, no, uh, in uh, There Will Be Blood. Yes? They are the anti-heroes. Anti they are not the triumphant individualistic heroes. They, yeah, they are loners, yes. They are highly ambitious individualistic, yes. But are the filmmakers glorifying them? No. So, that is what we mean by reworking of the previous style, previous genre. Now, um, we are also to uh, told that there is a category of pastish which is a parody according to Frederick Jameson that has lost its sense of humor. So, it is not a spoof. Now, you, you look at an out and out spoof, Johnny English is a spoof of James Bond genre, okay, the spy, the detective thriller kind of films. Okay. So, Johnny English functions very well as a spoof, a naked gun series, they function superbly as spoofs of the detective genre. Okay. So, those are spoofs, parody is something else, parody is not an out and out spoof. Okay. Parody is a uh, or rather pastish is a kind of parody, which is not intended to create humor or cause humor, a spoof yes, that is the main purpose of a spoof. Uh, this is another key theoretician who you should know about. Ihab Hassan and his seminal book, The Dismemberment of Orpheus, 1971. It has been reprinted several times. 
the most definitive work on postmodernism. The title is itself evokes the myth of Orpheus, the man who went to the Hades in search of his dead wife Eurydice and he is uh, once he is able to rescue, he is asked not to look back, you know the legend, but he cannot resist the temptation, he looks back and then his head is uh, you know severed off, uh, but the head continues singing while his lyre is in thousand pieces by his side. So, there is a, so why do we, why, why, why should Ahab Hassan use a title like Dismemberment of Orpheus or a book on postmodernism, Breaking Down, Fragmentation, okay. Breaking down of the central stable figure, but fragments are still important nevertheless. Modernism was essentially rational, postmodernism unlike the heroic modernist uh, and why do we call the uh, call him the heroic modernist, the artist in from modernism as the heroic modernist because he created works out of pure imagination. However, the postmodernist artist works with cultural givens trying to manipulate them in various ways and what are those various ways? Using parody, pastiche, collage, juxtaposition for various ends. Uh, Ihab Hassan gives us a definitive list where he distinguishes between modernism on one's hand and postmodernism on the other. Okay. So, uh, it is a long list, perhaps you would like to look at it. I can give you um, very few pointers from there. For example, he calls modernism characterized by romanticism and symbolism, whereas postmodernism is more Dadaist, more anarchic. There is form in modernism, the postmodernism is anti form. There is design in modernism, whereas postmodernism happens by chance. That is the idea given. Logos, words, is important in modernism, postmodernism characterized by silence. You read Samuel Beckett's works and you will find how silent his plays are. I am not just talking about um, waiting for Godot. There are other plays also. Harold Pinter is a master of silence and he has even written a play called Silence. Because there is nothing left to say anymore. Postmodernism believes in anarchy, whereas in modernism we had hierarchies. Modernism believed in having a finished work, complete work, whereas for postmodernism everything is a work in progress. Think a movie like Cynic Doc in New York. It's very abstract. Who directed it? Kaufman, Kaufman Brothers. I mean, the authors. The signature style is all over the movie. You don't even have to look for the name of the authors there. You know that it has to be um, Brothers Kaufman at work here, Cynic Doc in New York. So, it's a long list where Ihab Hassan talks about the major distinctions between postmodernism and modernism. The key words as we have already seen and you must remember modernism is focused on determinacy, give, trying to give some stability, some meaning, whereas postmodernism talks about indeterminacy. That brings us to the category of postmodern cinema and basically it is characterized by delegitimation of authority, which leads to indeterminacy and again erosion of a central idea of stability, of a structured order. Key features of postmodern cinema, fragmented editing style, 
See, Godard started it when he gave us the idea of jump cut, okay, and jump cut was so well suited to the fragmented times that by the time we came to Easy Rider and Bonnie and Clyde and other movies of that period, it had become a de rigueur of the period. So, fragmented editing style. Now, it has become all faddish, very fashionable, MTV style cutting. But that is there is no subtext there, there is no political subtext there, it is just like we want it is a fad, you know it gives uh, a, an impression of, um, f uh, of pace, okay. everything is moving on very fast. So, therefore, we need that kind of cutting. So, it is a fashionable trend, it's, it has got nothing to say about your society or about your cultural scene. Non-linear narrative, another important feature of postmodernist cinema, think modernism, think uh, Gigawarthov's cinema, remember? man with a movie camera, he is on the streets taking, but the, you know he looks at some kind of a period morning to night. Okay, so, there is a sense of linearity, okay, Charlie Chaplin's cinema, okay, there is a plot, okay, there is a serious linear coherent plot, whereas all that is, uh, all that goes for a toss in postmodernist cinema. Hyperlink and <coughs> hyperlink stories, hyperlink can you give me some example of? Amoris Peros. Let them hear. Amoris Peros. Amoris Peros. Are you familiar with this? Who directed it? Inaritu. Inaritu. Fiction is non linear. Would you call Babel a hyperlink cinema? Okay, so Babel is a hyperlink cinema. Magnolia. Good. Magnolia. Crash. 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 Which crash are you talking about? The Canadian crash? No. LA. Okay, Brandon Fraser's crash. Yes, so crash. So they, all these are examples of hyperlink cinema. The parallel story, seemingly unrelated, but uh, everything has a point to it, but may not necessarily be connected to one another. Fluidity of identity. We are looking very uh, skeptically at the concept of genres. Okay, what are genres? I mean, I am going to do Pulp Fiction with you soon and then I will ask you a question, does this movie have a genre? We have something like genre bending and genre blending, so does Pulp Fiction have a genre? That is your homework, okay? do it for tomorrow. Then intertextuality, we have already talked about allusions and quotations. Postmodernist cinema encourages multiple readings, of course. Literally celebrates anarchy, pulp fiction. Okay. It celebrates anarchy. I mean, we root for the anti hero, we root for those people who are completely out of the box. And they resist closure, no country for old men. What happens to Shiguro? He walks away, but not into the sunset. He is that kind of a western hero, just limps away, does, does not gloriously ride away, limps away with a broken body. Perhaps he may continue uh, murdering people senselessly, meaninglessly or he may meet his own end, who knows. There is no sense of closure there. Okay. And uh, I mean, uh, um, a more uh, Relevant example would be the way a serious man ends, Cohen brothers. Are you familiar with a serious man? Please watch it. It ends with a whimper, tremendous movie, hilarious, okay. it has wonderful lines, magnificently acted, but when it ends you feel, ah, I mean we were not expecting this.
resist clo uh, closure completely. So, watch it, a serious man by Cohen brothers. I mean Cohen brothers, Tarantino, Paul Thomas Anderson, you can look at these names as key people who have spearheaded the mo uh, movement of postmodernism, at least contemporary postmodernism, the way we understand it today. Um, this is another concept that you should be uh, familiar with, Chinese box structure in postmodernist texts. So, the focus is on skewed and distorted narratives, subject to abrupt shifts and transformations and ambiguous about its boundaries. Think of the big Lebowski if you have not already watched the movie and it fits all these characteristics. So, a Chinese box structure in a text suspends normal categories of time and space, social and rational categories which are built up in everyday architecture and behavior to become irrational and quite literally impossible to figure out. You were just talking about Pulp Fiction. Does Pulp Fiction satisfies, satisfy all these categories? Complete erosion of boundaries, defying genre, hmm? defies uh, rational, temporal, spatial categories. Now, uh, there is a, a, a novel by Umberto Eco. I have referred to it in one of my earlier classes the name of the rose, yeah, which brings together the elements of the popular detective genre, medieval history, life in a monastery, philosophy and theory of semiotics. So, now what is pastish now? If you look at pastish, pastish is nothing but bringing together of high as well as the so called low art. So, if detective genre is the so called popular art, theory of semiotics and theology and philosophy, these are high culture decidedly. Okay. Umberto Eco's, who is a known semiotician anyways, so he writes a novel, the, na uh, the Name of the Rose and shows us how a work of art can function as a pastiche. And it is a supreme example of pastish, nothing gets better than that. So, bringing together of disparate elements. So, mixing of levels of culture creates a kind of hybridity. So, this is another key term that all of you should remember. Postmodernist text is hybrid, it is fragmented as a Chinese box structure is heteroglossic. Okay, so, creates a high kind of hybridity that challenges the traditional notions and then you think we were just referring to Cynic Doc in New York, also a film like Inception. How does it close? How does it end? Ranjit, can you tell me how does the movie end? Uh, the movie ends with him spinning the top. Yeah. And they, they just show the top keeping on spinning and the movie ends with that. And people have done so much of research on that spinning of top. What does it suggest? Does he live on or is he dead? How many of you think that DiCaprio character is alive at the end? And half of you think that he, uh, maybe you did not watch the movie at all. It is very yeah. ambiguous. Yeah, this yeah. Thing is, uh, his ring is his totem, yeah. whereas mm. the top is his wife's totem. So yes. Therefore, that means that he is in the real world. Okay. Like, so, there is some kind of an ambiguity. So, what we are saying, it requires multiple viewing of the movie. So, that is what a postmodernist text is all about. Hmm. Now, we will talk about uh, uh, Chinese box structure, narrative fragmentation as well as pastiche with reference to a list of films, Moulin Rouge, the German movie Run, Lola Run, Zelig, 
by Woody Allen, Memento, Fight Club, Requiem for a Dream. So, these are the movies that we will be discussing with reference to fragmentation and pastiche. So, Moulin Rouge is a movie made by the Australian director Baz Luhrmann. What is he making currently? The Great Gatsby, based on Fitzgerald's novel. So, Moulin Rouge is one movie where song and dance sequences, all those stage sequences are done in a very fragmented MTV style editing pattern. So, movie is basically very self-conscious and it is truly and globally postmodern spectacle. Now, why do we call it a global phenomenon? You look at uh, the director himself, he is Australian. Um, the hero, Evan McGregor, he is Irish, Scottish, raised in England, a major uh, British actor who also um, occasionally flirts with Hollywood cinema. Hmm? Then you have Nicole Kidman, born in Hawaii, but raised in Australia, and now she is a major Hollywood actor. Okay. So, a, a, a film which has an international assemblage of people, of, uh, of artists to say. Hmm? Now, musical styles which are extremely identifiable, ad identifiable in Moulin Rouge, one is European vaudeville, no? uh, set pieces, one acts vaudeville, cabaret culture of course, stage shows, comic operas, pop songs, she even does a, like a virgin at one point if you remember. And uh, some of the Italian style melodramas, the operas. Also, they also refer to uh, the Bombay cinema also, when uh, she performs to Chamma Chamma. Okay, so now, nostalgia, and this is a favorite term of the postmodern critics. Nostalgia is a prevalent mode in postmodern films, and you can look at a list of movies. David Lynch's Blue Velvet. What is it all about? Yes, Palari. Suburbia, yeah. And what happens? Hmm. Okay, so the idea, uh, let me tell you that David Lynch in Blue Velvet interrogates the so called myth of the calm, placid American suburb, okay, the small town uh, decency. Okay. So, generally, we are told, uh, you know, um, popularly, the, the popular perception is that uh, the rottenness and the corruption. These are the attributes of city life. Countryside, everything is hunky dory. Hmm? People are good, people are essentially honest, uh, people are essentially, uh, they prefer to live in uh, harmony with each other. But, people, uh, but David Lynch in uh, Blue Velvet tells us that behind or beneath the veneer, beneath the facade of uh, decency and uh, harmony, there is a rot that exists. And this is nothing, this is not a, uh, something that David Lynch actually gave us. Hitchcock has already done this in one of his earlier films, where he shows us the corruption of the rural life, the countryside, which appears very different on the outside, but what lies beneath is a different story altogether. Which movie? Yes? Not Psycho exactly. Psycho falls somewhere when, you know, on the roadside mortal and some, but. No, no, Rare Window is an out and out city movie. I am talking about a film called Shadow of a Doubt. Please do watch it. 
shadow of a doubt, Joseph Cotton. So, intrigues and manipulations of a small town and countryside life. And now, Cry Baby, what is Cry Baby? It is a 90 movie, 1990. Throwback to those Elvis Presley times. Please do take it down okay, and watch it. It's May, it's a made to order kind of film for your generation. It stars a very young Johnny Depp doing an Elvis Presley on us. And he is the titular cry baby. He cries at the drop of a hat. So, what he is giving us is a mishmash of all those Elvis Presley movies. Then. Um, James Dean, Rebel Without a Cause, as well as John Travolta, uh, his Danny Sucker persona from Greece. So, it's a, it's a highly elusive, extremely referential movie to these great films of the 80s and uh, the 60s even. Then you have Hairspray, you are aware of that, Pleasant Will, Edward Scissorhands. Again, it is a very nostalgic film. What does, what is the idea about? See, there are, there are two kinds of uh, films that exist, two kinds of periods that exist in Edward Scissorhands. One is the castle, which is very gothic. Hmm? Vincent Price is the crazy scientist who creates this beautiful lo robo, but the robo cannot be completed uh, because of the scientist's premature death. Now, uh, at the same time, you have the interrogation of the American suburbia. If you look at the movie carefully and if you look at the way um, Tim Burton creates the setting for the American suburbia, houses are all in candy floss pastel shades. So, you have those, uh, the mint green, the pinks, uh, the very pleasant yellows all over the place. The idea is that countryside, the suburbs are calm, placid places, but are they? Adversizer hence, who epitomizes everything that is beautiful and innocent, is literally driven away by the manipulations of the so called innocent suburban folks. Okay. Um, the Truman Show and then you have pastiches of uh, Hitchcock films. We were, the other day we were talking about how people like Brian De Palma make you. So, now you understand pastiche is not necessarily a spoof. When Brian De Palma uh, refer, refers to or makes a reference to Hitchcock's rare window in body double. Okay, or even in dress to kill. Hmm? He is not spoofing them, he is alluding to them. When Brian De Palma again refers to uh, Einstein's Odessa step scenario okay, in the untouchables and also to an extent in um, Carlito's way. Remember we were talking about Carlito's way the other day, it is not a spoof, it is a pastiche. Uh, fragmented psyche, it's schizophrenia and delusion. So, schizophrenia is an um, integral part of postmodernist literature. Think all David Lynch's films. Do you agree with me that Mulholland Drive is essentially about characters with fragmented psyches? exception. Dead Ringers by David Cronenberg. Uh, also, he is a Canadian filmmaker, also watch his crash. Therefore, I got confused when you said crash. So, there are two crashes. Uh, David Cronenberg's crash came in 86. 86. The Hollywood crash was uh, maybe the 2000s. Yes. Eternal sunshine of a spotless mind, being John Malkovich, a serious man we have already talked about, 
शटर आइलैंड इंसेप्शन द लिस्ट गोज ऑन पोस्ट मॉडर्न सिनेमा ऑल्सो रिजिस क्लोजर एंड देन यू हैव सेवरल एग्जाम्पल्स पल फिक्शन द ब्लेड रनर वी रियली डोंट नो इफ हैरिसन फोर्ड कैरेक्टर इज रोबो और नॉट वॉट वॉट इज द टर्म दैट दे यूज रेप्लीकेंट यस इज ही अ रेप्लीकेंट और नॉट वी आर नॉट वेरी श्योर नेचुरल बॉन्ड किलर्स रन लोला रन आई मीन हाउ डज इट एंड वी आर टोल्ड दैट इट्स अ हैप्पी एंडिंग बट इज इट बिकॉज ही गिवस अस डिफरेंट एंडिंग्स a different time he gives us so many endings it's up for it's up to us to choose so when it ends happily on a happy note we are still left skeptical about it is it really happening or it was it just an mtv video we just watched all iranian cinema i know there are fans of iranian cinema in this class and most these of these films they don't have a satisfactory conventional closure cinema of wong kar wai except in the mood for love most of his movies don't have a closure think uh, fallen angels and fallen angels is also a good example of hyperlink cinema have you watched fallen angels chunking express yes okay watch chunking express and watch fallen angels it's a pity our course is coming to an end i won't be able to do chinese cinema for you because it was very much in the pipeline but don't worry we are going to have one web course also uh, apart from this video module we are going to have web course also so i will try to include chinese cinema i'll definitely include chinese cinema and iranian cinema in that module okay so post modernist cinema another key feature is its self conscious and self referential it alludes to itself woody allen's zelig played sam the purple rose of cairo all films by woody allen stardust memories felinis 8 and 1/2 wag the dog how, how many of you have watched wag the dog please do watch wag the dog natural born killers but in fink are you familiar with uh, tim burton's edward yeah what is it about why do we call it a self conscious cinema it's about the movie director of the 50s and 60s edward and It's basically about his efforts to make the movie, which has been called the worst movie ever made, and the cast. Is he consciously trying to make a worst movie ever made? No. No, he's not. No, he believes in his own genius, and uh, there is that memorable sequence where he bumps into the great Orson Welles at one point, and Orson Welles says that you know you keep on doing what you are doing, okay? You are good at it, and he takes it as a big sign of. hope and encouragement so the cinema commenting on itself that self referential cinema will make us ex- extremely conscious of their art of making films uh, through falls day for night is another excellent example you must watch it through falls day for night and nicole kidman is starring to die for she literally dies for her 15 minutes of fame so we'll continue with our postmodern cinema tomorrow thank you very much